The sermon title this morning is, How Can I Trust? We live in a world where it's becoming increasingly difficult to trust. It always seems like people have an a ulterior agenda. There's scammers around, there's people calling you, trying to sell you things that, that, you, don't, that you don't need. I know when I, when I walk into shopping centers and I see those people that have set up shop in the middle there and they try to go up to you as you walk, I get out my phone and I start looking through something so, that, so they don't, oh yes, <laughs> no, I don't do that. But <laughs> I got a call from a telemarketer a few, a few weeks ago. And they were trying to sell me a different internet provider. And I, I told them, no, I'm quite happy with the one I have. But they continued saying, oh, no, no, this one will be better. I'm like, okay, I'll hear you out. I don't like hanging up on people. So after talking to him for a while, I, I, I told him, the service that you're offering is more expensive than the service that I currently have. But not only that, it provides less data than the service that I currently have. And most people, when, when you show them that the service you have is better than the one they're trying to sell you, generally leave you alone, but this gentleman wouldn't. He continued insisting that, that I'm better off if I go for his service. He started saying things like, oh no, that the internet will change soon, and if you don't change your service, later on you'll be paying more. I'm like, well, if I change, I'll be paying more right now. <laughs> but someone actually told me that one, what, one thing you can actually do is ask them to remove you from the calling list. And by law, they, they have to remove you from the calling list. And I've since started doing that a few times, and I don't get quite as many calls. Now, the reason I've resorted to asking people to remove me from calling lists is because I don't really trust the people that are calling me. I don't trust that they have my best interest at heart. When we think of someone who trusted God, when we think of someone who believed in God, who's, who's a name that comes to mind from the Bible? Esther. Abraham and Esther. Abraham is someone who, who really trusted in God and was an example for, for humanity. We read in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I, I like Abraham's response. He, he didn't say, well, hang on, hang on a second, God. Let me check out the current deal I have and, and see if, if the one that you're offering is better. When, when God said, I will bless you, Abraham was like, sweet. And one of the best known verses about Abraham's attitude towards God is found in Genesis chapter 15 verses 5 and 6. It says, Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. When God said to Abraham, Your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky. Notice Abraham didn't say, um, I don't have any descendants. How, how is this going to happen? No. He believed in the Lord. He was like, sweet. It's not that hard to trust in God when things are going well. When everything around us is going well, it's easier to trust in God. When I think of Abraham's life, his life went pretty well. Yes, he had to wait a long time for, for this promise to be fulfilled. But during that time, he was so prosperous. In fact, him and Lot had to separate because God was blessing them so much that they, they couldn't stand together. There, there wasn't enough room for them to stand next to each other. In fact, when Lot got taken captive, 
Abraham sent 318 of his servants which had been born in his house. Think about this. This wasn't just 318 servants that he had acquired. These were actual servants which had been born in his house. God blessed him abundantly. Other times, it, it's not as easy to trust in God when things are not going so well. When I was studying theology, I had a, a really good friend. His name was Danilo. In fact, there were four of us students who were studying the graduate diploma, which, which became really, really close. And one of them was Danilo. Danilo was an amazing guy. He had the, the biggest smile. and he, he was always smiling. He lighted up the room when he came in. In fact, he used to always say, I love you, man. And I remember when he first said this, I was a little uncomfortable. But he just continued saying that. And I just saw it. He was just so full of love to all of those around him. All the girls at Avondale were, were crazy for him. They would like follow him around. A couple of months ago, Danilo was involved in a car accident. A truck crashed into his car and killed him on the spot. And I remember thinking, why God? Why did you allow this to happen? I know I, I'm not the only one. I know that, that there were many people who had this exact sentiment. Danilo loved God. He was planning to become a minister. Why would God allow something like this to happen? Usually when difficult times arise, people... Bring up Romans 8.28, which says, We know that all things work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And I have to say that I fully believe in this promise. But I also have to say that when Danilo died, This wasn't all that comforting for me at the time. And I'm not sure how it was for his family, but I know that they suffered. So it, it just seems so senseless. God has given us a number of examples in the Bible of people who put their trust in him. One of my favorite of these examples is Joseph. The story of Joseph was one of my favorite stories as a child. And it's still one, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's filled with problems and, and with Joseph ultimately becoming essentially the second most important person in the world. And when we think of the way that God led in Joseph's life, we can get carried away because we know what happens at the end. See, we know how Joseph's life will turn out at the end. But Joseph didn't know this. As, as he was going through life, he, he, was, he didn't know where he would end up. So as we think about the story of Joseph this morning, or well, this afternoon now, I'm just going to briefly ask that you try and put out of your mind that you know how the story ends. I know that's, that's not easy to do. You see, Joseph was the favorite child. He was the firstborn of Rachel, who was the favorite wife. And not only was he born into being the favorite child, but his character was a character that reflected God. His character was a, a character of, of someone who was obedient, someone who was loving towards God, someone who continued following 
in the instructions that God gave, unlike many of his brothers. And Joseph was dedicating himself to God. And then, around the age of 17, Satan threw him a curveball, and he found himself at the bottom of a pit. And I can only imagine what's going through his mind at the moment. And he's like, Lord, please, help me. He would have sat there kneeling, Lord, please get, get me out of here. Please, Lord, touch the hearts of my brothers. I know, I know that Reuben didn't seem he really wanted to go with this. Maybe touch his heart. Lord, please speak to them. Help, help me to get out of here. And as the hours went on, I'm sure that Joseph started thinking, where are you, Lord? What's happening? And then the rope comes down and he's like, yes, finally I'm about to be rescued. But as he is brought up out of the pit, he sees his fate. Many thought slavery was a fate that was actually worse than death. Inspired Writings tells us that at this time, Joseph went through a stage of despair, and understandably so. Can you imagine how he felt? Lord, I've been trying to follow you to the best of my ability. I've been doing everything you've asked. What's happening? Why, why am I here? And as the years go by, he gains a prominent position in the house of Potiphar. He was there for 10 years. Then, as we know, Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, and he says, no, no, I cannot do this against my God. I will stand up for what's right. And he did. And in return for standing up for what's right, he got thrown in prison. Again, I can imagine as he's, he's praying to God, Lord, please, get, get me out of here. Potiphar knows I'm not guilty of this. Let me out. And God seemed silent. And as the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, he learned to deal with the things that God had allowed to happen in his life. It wasn't until 22 years after he had gone to Egypt, that he was able to finally say, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about as it is this day to save many people alive. After 22 years, he finally understood why God had allowed this suffering in his life. I'm someone who has experienced a lot of suffering in my life. And I would say that a large part of this, probably the vast majority of this, was due to the fact that I'm an idiot. And I just did a lot of stupid things. But there are some of the things, some of the suffering that happened in my life wasn't in my control. And I remember at the time thinking, why, Lord? I look back on it now and I realize that through the trials that God has brought me through, He's helped me with two specific things. One is that I've been able to empathize with, with a group of people I wouldn't have otherwise been able to. And the second one was that He allowed this suffering that I realized my need of Him. He was looking for my eternal well-being. One of the founders of the Adventist church, Ellen White, writes, we desire to follow Christ and be like Him, but we shun trials and remain a distance from Him. Suffering and trials bring us nigh to Jesus. They bring us closer to Jesus. The furnace consumes the dross and brightens the gold. I've noticed that God has a twofold plan for us. One is He designs to prosper us here on this earth. He desires to give us a, a temporal blessing. But the second one is he desires our eternal good as well. And sometimes 
this means us going through suffering. When we're going through this suffering, we want to know why. See, if we understood why, then it would be easier to bear. I know that, that if Joseph understood that 22 years from now, you are going to be second to Pharaoh. He would have experienced his time in Egypt very differently. It, it wouldn't have been such a trial for him. But God doesn't always tell us why. But he does give us examples in the Bible, such as Joseph, of where trial leads to a temporal blessing. However, we have other examples in the Bible that are much more difficult to understand. John the Baptist was declared by Jesus to be the greatest man who ever lived. John the Baptist had the, the blessing of being able to introduce the Messiah to the world. He was able to say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was able to say, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The faith that he had was amazing. And at first, John practiced his ministry alongside with Jesus. In fact, when his disciples came up to him and they said, John, he's also baptizing. What's going on here? He's like, chill, guys. This is the way it's meant to be. He must increase, but I must decrease. And then Satan threw him a curveball, and he found himself in chains. Inspired writings tell us that this was extremely difficult for John because he was used to being outside all the time. As the days turned into weeks, and as the weeks possibly turned into months, I can imagine... John thinking, what's going on here? Why is God allowing this? Why is, is he not rescuing me from here? And then a little bit of doubt started to creep in his mind. Did, was it really the Messiah? Maybe I made a mistake. And, and that's why he's not rescuing me. So he sends his disciples to ask Jesus. And his disciples bring back an answer. And, and I like the way that Jesus answered them. He said, go tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. What Jesus did by responding in this way was not only simply say, I'm the Messiah. Which may have been enough for John. But he didn't just tell him he's the Messiah, he proved it to him. John knew the scriptures. He would have known that in Isaiah 35, 4 to 6, and in Isaiah 61, verse 1, these were the identifying characteristics of the Messiah. So when he heard, not only that Jesus said he's doing these things, but when his disciples told him, we've seen him actually doing these things, his faith was strengthened. And, and he stopped doubting that this was the Messiah. I can only imagine that he's now thinking, okay, any minute now, any minute now, Jesus is going to get me out of here. I don't know how he'll do it, but, but I just know he's going to get me out of here. And then Satan throws him another curveball. Herod's wife's daughter comes to Herod's birthday party where Herod is no doubt intoxicated, as are most likely most of the people there. And she dances a little dance for him. And in his inebriated state, he decides to make a grandiose statement. Most likely it wasn't for her benefit. Most likely it was to show off to the people there just how much power I have. He says, anything you want from me, up to half my kingdom, and the response comes, the head of John the Baptist. Why, God? Why would you allow the greatest man who ever lived 
to lose his head because some little girl did a dance and someone who was drunk said something he shouldn't have. Why did God allow this? From the story of Joseph, we get to understand that God has our eternal blessing in mind, but also a temporal blessing in mind. From the story of John the Baptist, we sometimes find out that God may overlook the temporal blessing so that we can receive the eternal one. When Jesus sent message to John the Baptist, he sent him two things. The first thing he sent him was the certainty that he was the Messiah. But the second thing that Jesus sent him was the faith to be able to endure the trial that was to come. The faith to be able to endure and guarantee eternal life. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. It's hard to say that when when someone has just lost their head. I sometimes worry about many things in my life. I worry about things like, where will God send us after our internship is finished? I sometimes worry about things like, what if I'm involved in a, in a horrible car accident or something and, and Gabrielle is left to look after Daniel and the one to come by herself? Or what about the other way? What if something happens to Gabrielle and, and I'm left to look after him by myself? I sometimes sit and I worry about this situation and this situation. It's an interesting quote which I found which says, Worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow. It only saps today of its joy. Worry only brings into today the problems of tomorrow. And Jesus actually told us not to worry. Jesus personally said to us, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What Jesus is telling us is, trust me. Trust that I have your temporal best interest at heart. And also that I have your eternal interest. He says to us, cast all your anxieties on him. Because he cares for you. I like the imagery here. The imagery here that I kind of get is one of fishing. It's like, cast all your anxieties on him. We often fail to do that. I know I do. Sometimes I I like show him my anxieties. I don't know how fishing would work if you just show the fish your bait from up here. Jesus tells us, cast our anxieties on him. And the reason that we struggle to do this is because when we cast something away, then we are no longer in control. And we hate not to be in control. We often come to Jesus and say, Lord, may your will be done. Lord, I trust that you will do what's best in this situation. And then we scheme and manipulate and plot and try to have our own will happen. And when it doesn't, we're like, Lord, why? Why didn't you answer my prayer? The problem that I've found is not that we don't love God. I believe that most Christians love God. The problem is that we don't trust Him. We struggle to release control and say, Lord, I trust you. We we have examples in the Bible of where when we put our trust in God, He sorts things out for us as best they can be here on earth, but also for our eternal good. We also have examples, examples like like John the Baptist and examples like my friend Danilo, where it's hard to understand. But we know that God has our eternal interest at heart. I wanted to ask you today, 
if there are things that, that you are holding on to, to cast them to Jesus and say, Lord, I don't understand what's going on. Father, it's hard to deal with this pain. But Lord, I trust you. And I'm going to give it to you today. Let's just close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to lift up your name and praise you, Lord. Because all things work together for our good, Lord. Even when we don't understand, Father, and even when it's really hard. Father, we want to say that we want to trust you. Lord, because we know that you put aside your temporal interest for our eternal interest. And for this, Lord, we want to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.